Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel. With me today is Ashish Birla, who's the general manager of RippleNet. Ashish, great to be speaking with you today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited to do this. I'm excited as well. We got some uh, breaking news this morning. But before we get there, I want to get to know you better. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Yeah, I, uh, I grew up in, in, in Detroit, uh, Michigan, and uh, you know, my parents immigrated to uh, the United States in the 1960s and, uh, you know, hunkered down in Detroit and, uh, uh, you know, born and raised here and then moved to San Francisco uh, right after uh, undergrad. And what did you do before working at Ripple? Yeah, before I was working at Ripple, I was uh, a software engineer and uh, I moved from Detroit to uh, San Francisco right as the internet was starting to take off. I'm totally dating myself, but uh, I, I moved there because I wanted to be part of the uh, internet revolution. Uh, and uh, in 2008, I, uh, I quit my job and went to business school. And in 2008, uh, we saw the financial markets crater. And I started thinking that there's gotta be a better way to build you know, financial systems than the uh, house of cards that uh, I learned uh, that it was built on. And, uh, and that's when I started learning a little bit more about crypto. Uh, what was your first encounter? Was it with Bitcoin? Did someone tell you about it? Did you read about it on a forum? Uh, how did you come across it at first? Yeah, I, uh, I read the white paper early on. I, I, I will be honest, I, it didn't click right away. Uh, but then I started learning about how the entire financial system is built on trust. And uh, when one component of that financial system uh, falls apart, uh, it's like a domino. The entire thing falls apart. And it was amazing to me because being part of the internet revolution, I saw what uh, the internet did to communication and information, how it uh, democratized access to so many good things. And it started to click uh, as I put those two things together. The whole thing is built on trust and, and something called bilateral relationships and contracts with banks around the world. Wow, there's a technology that can replace that trust. And that's known as blockchain. Uh, and at that point, Bitcoin. I started learning about that in 2010 and 2011 when I was at a startup in Silicon Valley and Mark Andreessen was on our board and started talking a little bit about the potential for Bitcoin to do what the internet did for information, uh, but do this for the financial system. Um, so I have to ask, and I'm assuming you hold some XRP, but what do you hold in your crypto portfolio? Well, I've, uh, I've, I'm super excited about a lot of different projects uh, over the years and uh, excluding, uh, you know, Ripple. Uh, you know, the, a couple other projects that I've been passionate about. One is about like Web 3.0 or Web 3. And that's really about building new kinds of applications in a decentralized way. But one thing you need to solve for that is decentralized storage of information. So Filecoin is something that I've been super passionate about uh, for a number of years. Uh, Ave is another one, A-A-V-E. Uh, met the founders uh, several years ago. And this idea of uh, flash loans is the original concept uh, really uh, resonated with me as well. Cause I know how hard it is to build crypto liquidity and, uh, and how much capital you need. But a lot of times you only need it for a split second and Ave had a really good solution uh, this is, you know, as as uh, as the decentralized. This is before the whole DeFi boom. Uh, so I found that to be uh, super interesting uh, as well. And uh, you know, I'm I'm really looking at uh, you know new kinds of uh, decentralized organizations, and and uh, and there are a number of projects, uh, including Party DAO and others that I'm super interested in, uh, and I follow pretty closely. Awesome. Well, I want to switch gears because I know the folks watching and listening to this are uh, super excited about the news we heard this morning, and that is uh, Ripple ODL launch in Japan via SBI Remit. Can you give us uh, the overview of that? What What's happening there and the goal and the vision? Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I've been in crypto for, for eight years and I've been at Ripple for a long time. 
And one big learning is that some of this stuff takes time and you've got to bring customers along. So SBI Remit was one of our first customers that used our base RippleNet uh, product to move money between uh, Japan and uh, Thailand. And at that time, they didn't use uh, cryptocurrencies and XRP. But we kept building with them. We kept talking to them about the solution and we got the experience right. And now it's been amazing to see them migrate from a, uh, a non-ODL solution only to a hybrid and now using ODL uh, for SBI Remit. So a big win, but again, like, you know, it's patience, it's building for the long term. And uh, again, sometimes it takes time to get the experience right. Uh, and then you also have the regulatory aspect to make sure that the, we're bringing the regulators along in Japan. But again, things aligned, uh, you know, could have been done quicker, uh, maybe, uh, but I'm pretty happy with the progress. I think it's going to be a great partnership for both ends, but not only Ripple, but also for uh, SBI Remit. Excited about uh, the potential there. Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing. And of course, the real world problem you're solving for people where, uh, from what I read on Ripple's website, the article, that uh, workers who are from Philippines working in Japan can easily now send money home uh, faster. Um, and will the ODL or, or liquidity come from SBI, VC Trade, and Coins.ph? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, sourcing from both uh, exchanges, one on the origination side and one on the destination side in the Philippines. And what's it's interesting is that they don't have to pre-position capital. Mm. So to get that instant experience prior to ODL, they would have to pre-position capital in the Philippines. But now they can instantly move money back and forth and provide a real-time experience for their customers. Now, days matter uh, for a lot of people, but for remittances, uh, a couple of days earlier to get your capital at a cheaper rate is super compelling and it's life changing for a lot of the people that are beneficiaries of remittances. And so, you know, I, I, like it's, it's really, uh, it's really pa a passion of mine to see uh, how the human aspect of this technology uh, is, uh, is also benefiting as well. Sure. Um, and from what I read, also, there's plans to expand and maybe create some new corridors um, for ODL as well in the APAC region. Can you tell us about those respective plans? Yeah. So, uh, you know, we have a number of really strong partners uh, in the region and, uh, you know, including uh, partners in the Philippines uh, and where the regulation is clear for us. Uh, we want to expand in that region. Uh, our product, uh, our product suite is really resonating with uh, with Asian uh, customers for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's pretty hard to get uh, capital uh, in in the Southeast Asian and South Asia uh, region. Uh, they don't have the uh, infrastructure that uh, the U.S. has and the U.K. has in terms of credit history and so forth. So we're, we're seeing a lot of uptake there as well. And secondly, uh, just like Japan, uh, Thailand, Philippines, and so forth, they have uh, proactive regulation uh, that is uh, making it clear uh, of how to regulate uh, cryptocurrencies. And so you're seeing adoption from larger financial institutions, larger corporates, and, uh, and fintechs alike. It's, it's a fast growing market we're well positioned to capitalize on that. We had a banner year in Southeast Asia in 2020. We're following up that with uh, you know, great uh, success in 2022 uh, on the heels of the news you just mentioned with SBI uh, remit out of Japan. Now, um, I, I think it goes without saying with, with the respective SEC lawsuit and lack of regulatory clarity in the United States, um, are there any of your clients in the United States who are waiting for the clarity to uh, get started in ODL to move money overseas and in some of these uh, different corridors? Yeah, we've been using different uh, tactics to get the experience that they want uh, out of ODL without having to necessarily uh, touch digital assets uh, directly until there's clarity. So there's definitely some customers that are 
not interested in leveraging ODL in the United States until there's uh, regulatory clarity. And so we're looking at a lot of different options. The U.S. market is massive. It is a very innovative in the United States as well. That's not a market that we want to turn off and wait. Uh, so we're going to look at an, a number of different uh, uh, ways to get them to uh, get the benefits that we're seeing uh, across the world here in the United States. Uh, it's just going to take some time for us to sort all that out. Sure. Um, I, I have to ask, and I understand that certain things are going to be under NDA and, and uh, for timely release. Any hints as to how you're going to go about that? Would it be through a third party, uh, any partnerships or things like that? Anything you can let us know on that front? Well, it's, it really is is a partnership with our customers. So we've been talking to a lot of our customers to see like what kind of experience they want and how to bring that to market. So it, it could be a combination of partnerships, could be a combination of, uh, you know, the kinds of licensing that we would need uh, to provide that experience. All options are on the table. But again, we want to hear from our customers and we want to hear for, you know, what's going to make it a good experience for them. Uh, we're about removing friction uh, and, and that is really going to take uh, a bit of a time. It's not going to be one solution. It's probably going to be a combination of uh, a few solutions to bring that to market. Sure. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned was the, the, it takes time and bring your customers along because they're used to the traditional system and that infrastructure has been around for so long. So for them to jump onto a new emerging technology right away doesn't sound possible. But w what, are, what are the efforts you guys are doing in educating them into show them uh you know the process and i know you know on ripple's website you have american express bank of america santander all these different banks how are you engaging with them to educate them and to push them along kind of you know how you got sbi remit to, to move along with this yeah that's a, it's, it's a excellent question and uh i will say like you know starting from our founder chris uh, he's very patient and, uh, you know, his, his companies have been ahead of the market for a number of years because he believes in building and bringing folks along. And uh, we have a very strong regulatory team that is working with regulators across the world to educate them on the benefits of digital assets, assets and uh, blockchain technology. We have touch points with our customers uh, from Santander to other large uh, banks to bring them along uh, on the journey. And you know what, like in, when I started at the company in 2013, no one wanted to talk about digital assets. Sure. It was almost a dirty word. Uh, and now, uh, you know, the, the news in the market is incredible. I mean, Goldman Sachs contemplating a, a Bitcoin ETF, Tesla holding cryptocurrencies on its balance sheet. Uh, Square going full hog into crypto. It's it's a completely different market. And what's important is that we've been laying the tracks and we've been uh, building the infrastructure so that now uh, we're having a lot of our customers come to us and say, listen, uh, we weren't interested a couple of years ago, but now I'm seeing the benefits and it's starting to click. How can we use Ripple for more than payments? And that's been really interesting product feedback that we've been incorporating into our plans going forward. Sure. Um, so I want to ask you about the recent article you penned about tokenization and uh, on the XRP ledger, NFTs, stable coins, CBDCs. Can you uh, give a snapshot of that? You know, and and what what is Ripple currently working on to move in that direction, in addition to payments and and, and things like that. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really uh, excited to continue to partner with uh, uh, one of my favorite people, you know, Monica, who's leading Ripple X, uh, and uh, I'm leading Ripple Net. And uh, we share a vision about, uh, you know, tokenization. And when we both got started at Ripple years ago, the unique thing about the XRP ledger was that you could tokenize all sorts of different assets. And early on, we had gold, you know, tokenized on the uh, XRP ledger. We had Bitcoin, you know, tokenized on the XRP ledger and so forth. And what's changed is not that that wasn't possible back then, but there was a certain sequencing of things that needed to happen. Uh, folks had to become comfortable. Some of the great points you brought, folks had to like, you know, be brought along on the journey. But in my opinion, 
I feel like almost every asset that can be tokenized will be tokenized in the future. Both assets that we uh, we know about today, like fiat in the, in the form of stable coins, but assets that we haven't dreamt up yet in the case of new exciting types of NFTs. And uh, we want to be positioned and we have the technology uh, both through Ripple and also the decentralized XRP ledger to execute that. And so that is going to only accelerate. Again, like part of it is folks have to be comfortable with this new technology, but when it clicks, I think it's going to be a race. And you're already seeing, I mean, how many new companies have you seen in the last you know, several months, uh, not, you know, in the NFT space alone. Uh, so, you know, it, it, there was a time maybe six or seven years ago where I could name all the people in crypto. And now there's several a day that are coming up. And that's really exciting to me. But again, uh, it's really around this idea about tokenization and making these tokenized uh, assets liquid uh, or uh, fungible. And I think that's, you know, we're well positioned to execute on that vision. So specifically for NFTs, I'm waiting to build an NFT on the XRP ledger because I don't want to pay Ethereum gas fees, right? which are ridiculous. So I don't, I don't know how much you can share here, but what's the timeline? And are you partnered with like, let's say the Rarables and the Open Seas to get the XRP ledger as a platform to, to do this? So I don't have to wait forever. I don't have to pay high fees. What's the timeline? Yeah, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't let the cat out of the bag on the timing, but, uh, I, uh, you know, as a former product person, I know that, you know, timing is, uh, is something we can't keep close to our chest. Uh, but, you know, I think you'll expect to see more on the side chains in other infrastructure projects uh, that we've already talked about. I think David Schwartz, our CTO, has, uh, has some articles out there about the architecture of the technology, but, those are some of the enabling technologies uh, that will be surrounding the XRP ledger to enable exciting things like NFTs. And uh, I can tell you that uh, they're, they're working really hard on that. And uh, you know the synergies with RippleNet, I believe that uh, in some future, all of our enterprise customers are gonna want to also participate in the NFT ecosystem and whatever is tokenized in the future. And I see that as being the synergy between uh, the different parts of Ripple uh, come together. And uh, again, we, we hear so much from our customers, they never dreamt of uh, them being this interested in uh, tokenized uh, technology and blockchain, but why not come to Ripple? Uh, and I, I, you know, one interesting thing is like uh, the story about Cisco and Cisco started way before the internet, they were helping internal lands uh, and offices connect uh, with each other but they were positioned right for when the internet took off to also expand and offer internet connectivity services via Cisco. And I think that's really similar to the RippleNet and RippleVision. We have our products at customers and as this new financial world using blockchain technology unfolds, we're there, we're ready, and we're gonna expand uh, where it improves the customer experience and our customers want that kind of technology, they can get it from us. Yeah, absolutely. So theoretically, could Bank of America use RippleNet, use ODL to move money to certain corridors, in addition, while not launching artwork as in NFT form, but they could put certain contracts or certain documents in NFT form for distribution. Um, and they, they could also launch their own stable coin on, uh, the, on a side chain. Are, are what I just said, does that seem realistic as far as the use cases that you guys are trying to target? I see what you're doing there, but I'm not gonna, I, I can't really comment on like what Bank of America is going to do. Oh, okay, let's but... say Bank of Ashish or Bank of Tony. <laughs> bank of Ashish is a really trustworthy <laughs> bank. So I, I, let's go there. But yeah, yeah like the, the vision is that anything that is tokenized uh, with the products that we're deploying at our uh, customers, uh, we can expand. Uh, and, uh, and when I talked uh, in, in the tokenized uh, blog post, when I talked about, about you know, a custody solution, that's really like not only for cross-border payments, but you can expand that as other assets become tokenized. You don't have to change the product experience. Mm. 
So it's more like flipping a switch um, in, in, in sort of bridging the uh, traditional world with the real world using this technology. But, you know, again, like we want to try to uh, enable this world without the customers having to do a whole lot to change their uh, installation. That's why I thought the Cisco example was really great. Like they already had the routers at all these offices. It was almost just upgrading them uh, to connect to the internet, which made that company so powerful. You can think of it very similar. Uh, we have uh, a product deployed. It's a custody product uh, with our customers. Uh, as the world unfolds in this tokenized future, we're ready, we're there. Uh, and we can expand when they're ready uh, and when regulations are clear as well. Sure. Uh, so I want to ask you about uh, central bank digital currencies. It, I think it's public knowledge and it, you know, I've spoken to David Schwartz. Uh, Sagar Sabai has talked about how many central banks you guys are engaged with and talking with. Um, how, is, how, is the, how are the conversations coming along with, let's say, building CBDCs on the XRP ledger? Um, are you seeing movement there? Yeah, I think it's been a, an exciting uh, journey for, my, for us. And uh, we've been talking to uh, central banks for, for, a, uh, for a long time. Uh, and again, to your er great earlier point about bringing them along in the journey, uh, helping them understand the power of digital assets. And uh, CBDCs is only one of the technologies that we're talking to them about, but they're very excited about CBDCs. I think uh, the benefits that the XRP ledger has around uh, speed uh, and the fact that it was built for payments makes it a natural fit for CBDCs. And I think you'll see more and more uh, central banks around the world realize uh, some of those benefits. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not gonna happen overnight. Uh, you know, we're gonna build and, and gain momentum, uh, but uh, it, you know, it goes back, it's the same you know, sort of uh, you know, crypto primitives that a central bank's gonna need uh, compared to the Bank of Ashish and others. And that's what's exciting about it. Uh, it's different use cases, but the same uh, product suite uh, at a very, very high level. So we have some questions from the community. Um, and I hope these are my favorite, by the way. I love these. I, love, I saw some of the questions, and I'm excited. <laughs> uh, you know, some of it uh, was, you know, how many banks or payment companies are using ODL right now? If you can give a number um, or volume, you know, as far as what's moving on ODL. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have like the specific numbers, uh, but uh, you know, we've had tremendous growth uh, year over year. Uh, you know, accelerating uh, again over the last couple of quarters. Hope to have more to share there, but I don't have like specifics on the uh, on the numbers just just yet. Got it. And for the years, I think the question was, why did Ripple hire a DeFi team? If I'm not mistaken, if you can elaborate on that. Yeah, like the uh, the the DeFi team has been really uh, critical uh, to some of our product efforts uh, as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, you know RippleNet expanding into uh, lending uh, and how to scale that is really uh, about DeFi uh, and bringing that platform uh, together. and And so it's it's early on. We're still working on the uh, the lending vision. So far, our customers have loved the combined experience of ODL with line of credit, which is a type of uh, you know loan, uh, and you know scaling that is really going to uh, be possible by bringing some of the aspects of lending and DeFi uh, together uh, for our customers. But again, like we you know we need to work through the regulations and 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 so forth to, to make that a good experience. Uh, there's a question that uh, says, "Where do you see Ripple in ten years?" Yeah, I think that's a that's a that's a really good question. Uh, I really do think that uh, Ripple is uh, in prime position to uh, execute on this tokenized future, and uh, you know, from, from a number of aspects, uh, not only cross-border payments, but as different currencies around the world become tokenized in the form of stable coins or CBDCs. I think we have a great uh, technology and we have great momentum uh, executing on that. And what's exciting about that is that uh, we don't even know uh, all the different use cases that are gonna emerge with blockchain technology. 
just like when I joined the internet, I had no idea that we would be watching TV and all sorts of Netflix shows using the internet. Uh, we don't, we haven't even dreamt up all the different use cases that are going to come to, uh, uh, to, to blockchain. But I will tell you that uh, with our technology and with uh, what we're enabling our customers to do, we're going to be in a uh, prime position uh, to capitalize on uh, this exciting future. Uh, again, it, it takes a long time, but building the right infrastructure, educating customers as, uh, as they go along and bringing regulation and regulators uh, uh, up to speed alongside of this journey, all important components. Doesn't happen overnight, but we've been investing in this for uh, well over eight years. So let's talk a bit about crypto regulations. Um, obviously the entire crypto market, all different uh, projects and companies are waiting to see what's going to come out of Congress or the SEC in particular. Um, you know, what has Ripple been doing to help educate regulators? I, I remember if I'm not mistaken, you guys opened an office in DC. Um, was that part of the strategy? And are you working with other crypto companies to get Congress, get these regulators up to speed and what's happening, not just in the United States, but globally in the movement of blockchain and crypto? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been I've been really uh, happy with uh, on a global level uh, what I've seen from regulators uh, and especially the emerging markets. I think they realize that uh, way back uh, in the 90s, the United States uh, benefited greatly from being a proactive thought leader and creating the proper regulation for Internet, for the Internet. And now you've seen like, uh, you know, most of the top internet companies are based in the United States. And I think it started with, they were the first ones, the United States was the first ones to lay out that regulation in a bipartisan effort with, uh, you know, former President Gore and, and Bush and others. Uh, but that's not happening uh, today with crypto. Uh, you know, you are seeing the emerging markets uh, lead the way. I think they look at this technology as uh, as a way to leapfrog a lot of the developed countries that are slower to act, uh, and I think that's a mistake. But I'm I'm pretty confident that the the regulators uh, in the United States will uh, will create proper regulation uh, to enable uh, the next generation of innovation and uh, and help companies in the United States like Ripple, like Coinbase. Uh, and others uh, thrive and succeed. I think it's a missed opportunity if they don't, and I'm pretty confident that they're going to realize that and and uh, and get up speed speed real quick here. So I know you can't like talk about or go through too much details about the lawsuit. Um, do you feel that Congress may have to step in here and and readjust what the SEC is doing because they seem to be almost stuck in their ways and using an 80 year old how, uh, how we test, uh, which seems kind of ridiculous against digital assets and crypto. You know, what, what are your thoughts on, on the SEC in particular and what needs to happen there? Uh, I have like a lot of confidence in the, in the court system in the United States and ultimately it's really up to them to decide uh, and, 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 and make the decision on the SEC case uh, with, uh, with Ripple. But again, like I have a lot of confidence that the uh, the facts are going to uh, make this a pretty clear uh, case, and the judge will uh, ultimately decide uh, on on the ruling. The judge in the courts will ultimately decide on the on the ruling. But again, like I think it's uh, I think that the United States uh, will will definitely realize how big of an opportunity uh, this is. Um, at the end of the day, uh, it's it's good for innovation. It's good for business. It's good for uh, the United States to have a proactive uh, point of view on regulation with new technologies, uh, any, everything from green energy to, uh, to blockchain, just like they did with the internet. Uh, it, it, it had a, a lot of positive impact on, uh, on the US from a number of different fronts, both financially, but also business-wise and, and so forth. Uh, so let's switch gears and talk about the crypto market as a whole. Um, obviously we've had a run up to Bitcoin to about 64,000 altcoins followed. Then we had a steep correction and now we seem to have a breakout. You know, what are your thoughts on the market movements? Um, uh, not, not price predictions, but rather, do you see us, uh, there's another rally, another bull run left um, in this cycle? Uh, I don't know if there's another uh, bull run left in this cycle. 
I do know that I am super excited about all the interesting projects that I'm seeing out there. Uh, I do remember in 2017, uh, I wasn't excited. I was, uh, I was thinking that, you know, there's a lot of scams out there. Where's the real uh, use cases? Uh, I think in 2021, there are so many interesting projects. I don't even have time during the day to go and review them. Uh, and it's just a passion of mine to keep up the speed. So what's real about this uh, is that I think there's legitimate value being created not only from Ripple products, but from the entire ecosystem. I think that there's a, a whole bunch of different blockchains out there now that are going after new use cases from you know, creator economies, uh, you know, payments in the case of uh, the XRP ledger, uh, you know, smart contracts and DeFi with, uh, with the Ethereum uh, ecosystem. I think that's awesome. I think it, we should applaud the, uh, what's going on uh, globally, uh, even central banks, uh, thinking about holding uh, cryptocurrencies, whether it's Bitcoin or other crypto assets, that is great for the entire crypto ecosystem. It's becoming more stream. It's becoming uh, properly regulated in a number of different uh, you know, jurisdictions. That's what we should want. We should applaud that. And I'm, I'm pumped. I'm pumped for 2021. I'm pumped for 2022. Uh, what do you? Th what are your thoughts on Bitcoin miners leaving China? Some going to different countries, including the United States. And there seems to be a Bitcoin mining boom in the United States happening. Um, what are your thoughts on that whole situation? Yeah, I mean, like what I what I do like about it is this renewed focus on uh, not only moving out of uh, China, uh, where you know I think that's dangerous from a number of different reasons to have. China be such a big participant in, a, in, in the future, and I believe this is the future, blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. But I also like this renewed focus on taking uh, green energy uh, and green mining uh, more seriously. So whether it moves out of China or not, I think that's, that's one aspect. But I'm also hoping that it also moves to more green or to greener technologies uh, as well. And, uh, you know, I think that's uh, that's one thing I'm super passionate about, you know, outside of crypto is is uh, is preserving the earth for my you know, children and their children and so forth. Uh, I would hate to see that uh, this be a missed opportunity for Bitcoin to uh, leverage greener energy. Got it. Um, do you think a Bitcoin ETF is going to get approved this year? You know, I don't know if it's going to get approved. I do think that uh, it is a lot closer than it was, you know, in the prior attempts. Uh, it is interesting that, uh, you know, a, a stock like MicroStrategy that holds a lot of Bitcoin uh, is somewhat correlated with Bitcoin already. So, you know, you're not even that far off uh, from uh, something that acts like a, a ETF with MicroStrategy. Uh, I did see some speculation that Goldman was going to apply for uh, an ETF. Uh, around Bitcoin, uh, whether that's true or not, uh, I think that is exciting news. Uh, a substantial player uh, that knows how to work uh, through proper regulation, getting behind it, I think is good for the entire ecosystem. Uh, so I don't know. I always thought next year was going to be the year. So I'm not 100% sure yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I do feel like we're pretty close uh, in terms of uh, all the different components that need to make an ETF possible coming uh, together uh, soon here. Sure. And, and what we've seen like across uh, the globe in different countries, uh, Bitcoin ETFs getting approved, but then there's Ethereum ETFs. So could one day, could we see like an XRP ETF? And I don't know who would create that. It could be somebody obviously outside of Ripple. Uh, but do you see like that on the horizon in the coming years? I mean, I, I'm not sure what, what, uh, what's going to be possible. I will tell you like what I am super passionate about. Like, let's not, let's not forget what the original Bitcoin uh, white paper was about. That was about uh, individuals, you and me, uh, you know, someone, uh, someone in, in, in a village in India uh, having access to their own financial assets without having to trust a counterparty. Uh, without someone having to take tons of fees uh, away from them. And I'm passionate about more decentralized technology that enables that. Because, you know, you're going to pay a huge premium to whoever is going to custody the ETF. 
when I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be possible and the experience is going to be really good for individuals around the world one day, just like you can connect to the internet, you can hold your own financial assets uh, in your own wallet locally, securely, safely, without having to rely on an expensive counterparty. That's the vision I'm pa passionate about. Awesome. Well, I have a couple more questions and we'll wrap it up. So this is maybe a fun one. If you were to create your own NFTs, let's say artwork, what, what would they be about if, if you had an artistic side to you? Uh, that is a good one. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I don't know if I would, I, I think I would like actually help like a small uh, village create their own NFTs uh, to express their art, but also monetize it as well. Uh, and providing them with that kind of access would be super uh, game-changing and life-changing for, for local communities. So I'm looking for something like that uh, where folks can actually access a broader financial market and, uh, and help give them some uh, income uh, locally that wasn't uh, apparent to them in the, in the, in the past. Sure. So let's do some quick rapid fire. What, what's your favorite food? A favorite food. So I am in search of the best chocolate chip cookie. I have a sweet <laughs> spot for chocolate chip cookies. And I, you know, Levine's in New York City is definitely up there. I'm yep. sort of a sucker for the cheap Chips Ahoy cookie as well that my mom used to buy for me. But nothing else beats uh, my mom's Indian food. So it's a, uh, uh, you know, uh, chocolate chip cookies, and my mom's Indian food, top one, two right there. <laughs> uh, favorite musician or band? Uh, so I, I like a lot of uh, EDM and it's been, by the way, a side point, the EDM and crypto cross section uh, have, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. So a couple of my favorite artists are uh, Lane 8, RAC, who is uh, one of the first uh, musicians to create NFTs, love his music, uh, Rufus Del Sol, uh, Adeza, I know that was more than one, but there you go. Cool. Uh, favorite movie? Uh, favorite movie is uh, Back to the Future. Uh, I think I've watched it uh, 72 times at least. Uh, but every time I feel like there's like a new uh, little thing that I picked up that I didn't uh, pick up the prior time, which makes that movie uh, so exciting to watch. It's certainly one of my favorites, and I'm hoping they don't try to remake it. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, there's like a play or a musical in the UK, Back to the Future. So uh, you might want to check that one out soon. Awesome. I'll definitely check that out. Uh, favorite book? Uh, Khalid Hussaini uh, books, uh, Kite Runner. Uh, I loved it. Uh, great book. Uh, followed up by his next book. I think it was Spl uh, Thousand Splendid Sons. Both amazing. But I love, uh, love Kite Runner. And when you're not at Ripple, what are you doing for fun as a hobby? I am cheering my boys on at their uh, Little League baseball games. I love baseball. I love the Detroit Tigers, but I also love my kids' uh, Little League uh, games. And uh, it's, it's been a fun part of being a parent. And when I'm not working on crypto stuff, you can find me uh, you know, throwing pitches to my kids at a local ballpark. Uh, I know I, I said one more question, but I have to ask, any, any embarrassing uh, stories or anything you can share about Brad or Chris or anybody? <laughs> <laughs> oh man well i do i want to keep my job so okay. i probably won't say i don't know but brad and chris i will say have been just amazing people to work with and i have learned so much from working for and with brad and chris uh top integrity uh you know one of the two of the best people in silicon valley so i do make fun of uh both of them a lot but uh hopefully one day they see this and know how grateful i am they took a chance on me uh, early on and uh, credit them for, uh, for a lot of uh, uh, my success and Ripple's success. Awesome. Well, Ashish, uh, pleasure chatting with you, man. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Uh, this is a lot of fun and I'm going to go uh, search for a cookie now. <laughs>